Uh, good evening. Thanks. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, this is uh, the last event in the uh, fall semester series of the Sustainable Futures uh, Speaker Series. Uh, this is a, an event that's jointly sponsored by the Schatz Energy Research Center and the Environment and Community Masters Program. And we do these events um, usually seven, eight, nine times over the course of a semester. And um, uh, we'll have another similar lineup uh, next semester. So keep an eye out for, uh, for posters or flyers that look like these. And, uh, and we'll have, a, a, I think, another good series uh, next fall, um, or excuse me, next spring. And um, tonight uh, is a little bit of a, of a different format than we usually have. Instead of having one speaker, we have uh, five of us. Um, so really set up in a panel discussion format. And uh, we'll have uh, opening remarks from me and then each of the, each of the panelists. Um, I have some questions for them that I'll ask. And we'll have a bit of discussion. And then we'll take uh, questions uh, from the audience and hopefully have a, a very interactive back and forth. Um, and so that's how we're thinking of the layout for the session. Um, before we jump into that, I wanted to just very briefly introduce our panel and uh, really uh, thank our panel for, for coming together. I think we have uh, a lot of, um, of brain power here at the table and a lot of brain power here in the room. So it'll, it'll, it'll be a, a good and exciting discussion. Um, and so just uh, moving um, from one side to the other, we have John Stallman, who's an integrated grid planner for Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, Antoine Pfeiffer, of, uh, lead engineer for Principal Power. And Principal Power is a, uh, a company that develops um, offshore wind projects uh, and um, uh, really has uh, uh, cutting edge technology that I think is, uh, is unique in the world at this point. Um, uh, Matthew Marshall, Marshall is the executive director of the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. And uh, David Carter, uh, Managing Research Engineer at the Schatz Energy Research Center, and the project manager for um, the uh, Blue Lake Rancheria microgrid project, uh, which is one that we uh, are just in the process of, uh, of finishing up, which is uh, quite exciting and, and has some interesting dimensions that will come out in the discussion tonight. So thanks to, uh, thanks to the panelists, and thanks to all of you for, uh, for being here tonight. Um, the, uh, focus, of course, is, is on scaling up uh, renewable energy in Humboldt County and really just trying to understand both what are the opportunities for doing that and what are the challenges. Um, we're going to focus in particular on two uh, resource areas, which are uh, solar power and wind power with a focus on, on offshore wind. Um, but we'll also touch on uh, issues associated with uh, if we do in invest in those areas and, and are able to scale up those resources, uh, what does that mean for integration into the electrical grid and for management of the, of the grid? What are the, the practicalities of, of being able to consider this, as well as a whole range of other uh, considerations that could come into play, uh, both from, a, from an opportunity uh, side and from a, a challenge uh, uh, side of the, uh, of the story. So uh, look forward to an interesting uh, discussion. I also think that we're in a particular moment in um, uh, the possibilities for renewable energy where uh, a, a rapid scaling up is a possibility uh, here and um, uh, over the next, say, decade or so. And that's, uh, that's a inter very interesting moment to be in uh, and to think about, uh, think about this topic. So. Um, there it goes. Just uh, in terms of where we are now, um, we have, this is, uh, shows uh, current power plants in, in, uh, in Humboldt County. So currently we have um, uh, three biomass plants, not all of which are operating at the moment, but uh, three uh, primary uh, uh, plants uh, um, for biomass power, one in, uh, in Scotia, uh, one at Fairhaven, and one in Blue Lake. Uh, and we also have a natural gas-fired power plant uh, that's owned and operated by PG&E uh, at King Salmon, just to the south of Eureka. And then also shown on this map, but not uh, quite in Humboldt County, are several uh, hydropower plants that are j just right along the, the, the border with Trinity uh, County. Those are uh, fairly small uh, plants, but um, 
This is a, a map uh, generated by the California Energy Commission for all power plants uh, uh, that are at least one megawatt in size, so they, they, they show up. Um, so that's our current um, uh, uh, generation uh, sources. Of course, not counted here are all the small rooftop uh, and uh, uh, residential and commercial solar power systems and other, other smaller generators, but, but uh, uh, that's, that's our starting point at the, uh, at the, at the moment. Um, and in terms of resources, if we're talking about solar and wind energy resources, uh, this uh, shows the, uh, a map of the solar resource. This is not just Humboldt County, obviously, this is for all of California. Uh, but you can see that these darker areas are uh, um, uh, where the resource is uh, relatively stronger, and we're up here. Uh, and so our solar resource, especially right on the coast, is not surprisingly, it, it's uh, cloudy and rainy here, is not as uh, strong as the solar resource down south, but it's actually not a bad solar resource. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very respectable one. Um, but that's, uh, that's where we are with respect to uh, solar energy, and the, of course the resource gets better as you uh, move inland from, uh, fr from the coast. We do well with Germany. <laughs> uh, yes, we do. Um, and, um, so that's, that's uh, just in general what the solar resource looks like. The wind resource, um, this shows uh, the, the wind energy resource for California, and you can see uh, various places where there's onshore, but it also shows the offshore uh, wind resource. And if you focus in on our region, uh, so Humboldt Bay here, of course onshore, um, areas like Bear River Ridge and, and uh, out by Cape Mendocino, there, there are good onshore wind energy resources, but the offshore wind resources, uh, I think the correct word is phenomenal. Um, it, it's an amazing offshore wind resource in terms of, uh, of the scale of the potential power generation, but it's, uh, it's in very deep water. Uh, you need to move from Humboldt Bay probably 10 to 20 miles offshore to really get the, the, um, the, uh, the best resource, and that's a challenging environment to, uh, to operate in. And, um, uh, so the resource is very good, but there are some challenges associated with utilizing that, that, uh, that resource, uh, as well as a number of stakeholder and environmental considerations and the whole range of things that would have to be considered in the context of, of considering the development of it. Um, this is another um, uh, map that shows the offshore wind resource and, uh, and gives a sense of it. So the offshore wind resource here uh, f uh, in the northern California coast and the southern uh, uh, Oregon coast is perhaps the best uh, uh, in, um, certainly in the continental U.S. Um, uh, there's parts of the Aleutians that are windier, but uh, not that many people live there. Um, so very, very good uh, wind ener energy resource. Um, and then, of course, once if you're generating renewable power here and it goes beyond what you can uh, absorb locally. You have to start to think about um, how are you going to move that power uh, out. Uh, this shows uh, the two primary um, transmission lines that connect uh, uh, um, Humboldt County to the rest of, uh, of, the, of the California grid, grid. There's also a line that moves down uh, in this direction, but it's not meant to be a a, a primary transmission line is meant to serve the communities that are just along that, uh, that route. So you can see that we're, we're not an energy island up here when it comes to electricity, but we are an energy peninsula. Um, we are uh, somewhat isolated from the rest of the, of the main grid, and that's a factor when it comes to thinking about um, development of renewable resources at a scale that would allow for export of them. And so that's part of what will come up in the, in the discussion. And I think the uh, two last points before moving into the, into the panelists, one is that you have to think about, uh, when you're talking about wind and solar resources, intermittency is an important part of the, of the story. So this is just a generic uh, load curve, maybe <coughs> during the summertime somewhere in the United States. Uh, uh, so if you look at time of day and, and uh, what the, the load shape is, um, usually uh, a higher load in the late afternoon, perhaps related to an air conditioning uh, uh, load. And then when you think about when wind and solar uh, might be delivering uh, um, 
uh, uh, power, um, uh, the solar resource might look something like this on a clear sunny day. Um, so quite a bit, but concentrated in, in, uh, in the middle of the day. And wind resources are going to vary pretty widely depending on what site you have, but um, uh, often you might see patterns that look like this. This is showing a coastal uh, uh, wind resource and, and a non-coastal one. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, I think this is actually a Texas resource. So it's not, it's not specific to here, but it just uh, highlights the, the, um, uh, the intermittency of, of the resource. And so part of what has to happen when you're thinking about grid management is how, how are you going to meet the, the load with a, with a variety of resources, and when they're intermittent, you have to th think carefully about how that management is going to happen, either by having uh, other generation sources um, which can ramp up and ramp down uh, as the intermittents come in and out or by including uh, uh, storage uh, in the system or through demand response uh, where you can uh, change uh, the, the timing of when the load is, uh, is occurring or some combination of, of all of those, which is generally how it's done. So th this intermittency question will be part of the, the discussion because that's a key part of, uh, of the story of, of ramping up these types of renewable resources. Uh, last but not least, I want to just briefly talk through who are the players uh, in this game, and this won't be comprehensive, but big players include, of course, uh, the electric utilities, and for our region, uh, the uh, electric utility is PG&E, um, and uh, um, uh, utilities play a number of roles, but one of the primary ones is, is managing the transmission and distribution infrastructure. They also have some generating capacity, but not the, the bulk of it uh, anymore. Um, and, uh, and so management of the, of, um, of the uh, uh, electric distribution and transmission infrastructure is a, a, a core responsibility and a core function of, uh, of the utility. So they're obviously part of the story and, and a key player in, in, uh, in doing this. Second are independent power producers. So these are companies that uh, generate uh, the electricity. They could be uh, fossil-based uh, independent power producers, or they could be renewable. And in this case, um, an example of that, if principal power to, were to develop a, an offshore wind facility, they would be an independent power producer uh, or um, whoever end up being the ultimate owner of that facility would be the independent power producer for, uh, uh, and so delivering that power into the, into the, the system. Um, the California Independent System Operator, or CalISO, uh, is the, the entity that uh, manages um, both a, a market for, for power to facilitate buying and selling of that, of that power, and also play a role in uh, directing traffic in terms of the, the flow of, uh, of, of, of power into and out of the, uh, the various uh, points that it needs to go to. And so the, the California syst uh, Independent System Operator is, is located just outside of uh, Sacramento and, of course, would be a, a, a key part of any, uh, of any story. And then um, uh, community choice aggregators are relatively new on the scene uh, from the big picture of how, um, uh, how the electrical system operates. And up here, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority recently established a community choice aggregation district. Um, and they end up being the buyers of a, a good deal of the, of the uh, electricity that is, is um, uh, uh, distributed in this area. And then they on-sell it to, uh, to their customer base. And so we have uh, representatives from three of those four groups. We didn't bring, didn't bring up CalISO. But uh, <laughs> uh, so we have um, a representative from PG&E, uh, from an independent power producer, or, or a, an entity that, that uh, would be potentially moving into that area, uh, as well as um, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. And so that's a, a, just a very brief thumbnail of, of how all of those pieces uh, fit together. So without... Um, uh, uh, me talking any further, I, I think we should move into the, into the, uh, so I'll go back to the beginning. I should have put that one at the end, huh? as well. Um, I'll just go back to the title slide uh, so you can see the names of the, 
presenters. And with that, I'll pass it over to Matthew to make the, a, a few opening remarks. Thanks. Um, yeah, as was just mentioned, um, you know, uh, West Coast Energy Authority is a, a, a community choice aggregator, or community choice energy program operator. As far as you're not familiar with us, we're a, a joint powers agency of the county and all the cities in Humboldt County, uh, as well as the Humboldt Bay Municipal Water District. And we do a range of things, in, including you know, energy efficiency programs and electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, but you know, as was mentioned, starting in, in uh, May of this year, we took on the the component of supplying electricity to, to the county, being the, the primary default provider of electricity service to the county. And so, if you're not familiar with how that works, you know, basically it, the, the law, the community choice aggregation law, lets local governments on behalf of communities take on the, the generation component or the, the procurement component of where the electricity is coming from while um, continuing to work with the, the existing utility, in our case, uh, PG&E, in, in partnership with them, who they still continue to own and operate. Uh, the infrastructure, they still you know, do the metering and the billing, and so it's kind of a hybrid between like a municipal utility and an investor owned utility where we have the, the, the generation uh, piece of it and they've got the, the delivery piece of it. And so the, you know, the, the part that's exciting about that is it gives us local control over where our energy is coming from. And you know, really one of our focus has been on you know, obviously renewable energy, but in particular uh, local renewable energy. There's sort of pros and cons to that objective. Um, you know, if, if you look at uh, the, you know, the, the power plants locally and what, what exists locally, you know, as mentioned, there's biomass, there's some small hydro, there's the, you know, the natural gas plant. And so, you know, our, our current power portfolio, you know, on the local side, with including that, you know, distributed solar that, you know, we do buy back power from people that overgenerate on their solar arrays, but um, predominantly, you know, the existing infrastructure on local renewables in, in a scale is, is biomass. We've got a, the, the one that's operating is uh, the Humboldt River Company plant down in Scotia. We've got a, a contract with them, uh, which meets about 12% of our, our overall load. And the rest of that is solar, wind, uh, hydro, and some, some other resources from, from outside of Humboldt County. And you know, so when we're looking at saying, well, okay, we want to start doing more local, well, you know, why do we want to do that, and what are the, the trade-offs of that? And so you know, one of the big trade-offs is you know, the advantage of buying from outside the area is typically a price advantage. And, you know, if you look at like what we're paying, let's take solar for example, you know, the price we're paying for solar from those dark red parts of the state down, you know, in, in Riverside and, and uh, you know, where we have contracts for power, it's about, probably about half the price of what local sort of community scale, you know, larger project in, in Humboldt County um, would cost on a dollar per megawatt hour basis. So, you know, the, the, the price premium, it's, you know, it's a, it's a fairly, you know, more expensive proposition currently to, to you know, buy local as opposed to buying from you know, what are really like gigantic projects down in, in Southern California if we're talking about solar. Um, and so you know, the, the benefits though, as far as like, well, what's, what, you know, why, do we, why are we interested in paying more? You know, and really, um, one of the key ones is, you know, as was mentioned, we're in a kind of grid constrained area. And so if we really want to pursue the goal of having 100% local, 100% you know, renewable energy from anywhere, Right now, the infrastructure wouldn't let us import 100% of our, you know, energy needs, you know, from renewable sources. So, no matter how much solar and wind there was in other parts of the state, we couldn't import that to meet our local local demand. And so, we need local generation resources if we're actually going to get off of, you know, carbon resources in Humboldt County. And so, you know, that's, you know, from a long-term objective, that's a key one. You know, we've got some ways to go before we're going to hit that threshold, um, but that's a, a pretty relevant one. You know, the other piece of having local generation, whatever kind of generation is, is the, the energy security element of that. Of you know, something happens in a wildfire to those lines into the county, and you know, or the, the natural gas line that, that uh, feeds into the county, and that you know creates an opportunity in an emergency situation or disaster for us to really not uh, you know, to be cut off from the rest of the, the the state's energy supply. And so, you know, increasing resiliency from both just having any local generation, but particularly also distributed resources. That can that can help really meet local demand um, and, and provide that from from a local standpoint. And I think you know, kind of a, a tie on to that is is really just the ability to sort of take responsibility for our, our own energy needs. And so from sort of a you know a, a, a stepping up to the plate and, and not saying let's have other communities you know bear the burden of our energy consumption and you know what we're doing. And so being able to 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 integrate this um, you know resources into our community so that we're, we're meeting our needs with local resources, um, you know, has that sort of 
benefit to it. And then, you know, there's the economic development piece of it of, you know, if we're building solar in the community, um, you know, that's it's creating jobs, it's, it's you know, keeping our energy dollars local. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty excited, you know, a lot of our, you know, as I said, our goals are to move that forward and, you know, the, two of the, the areas that are really kind of big potentials is, you know, as was mentioned, offshore wind is our, our biggest kind of uh, opportunity, I think, from a scale standpoint. And then, you know, even though we're not as sunny as Southern California, we're still plenty sunny to, to make solar work. And so, you know, those are really, I think, the, the two areas that we're most focused on is how can we start moving forward with, you know, really deploying, you know, more solar in the community and then also looking to move forward uh, with the potential for, for wind and in particular offshore wind. And so, you know, uh, I think Dave's going to talk a little bit more about what we're doing on the, on the solar front as well as the sort of integration um, of that into the grid and, and doing something more than just solar, but really looking at you know, advanced ways to, to incorporate that into the community. And then, um, you know, we're, we, we actually, um, earlier this uh, fall, my board approved a memorandum of understanding to work with Principal Power on trying to take the next steps towards um, exploring a, a local wind project that would you know, help to you know, bring that technology to the West Coast and to California. So, uh, in terms of solar in, in, uh, in Humboldt County, um, it, as, as you saw on the slides, it's not, not the greatest resource here, um, but that hasn't stopped us. We're kind of doggedly determined as a county and to, to do uh, 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 environmentally uh, conscious things, and solar is, is one way to do that. And so, over the years, we've, we've you know, we've, we've had many years of you know single kilo, single digit kilowatt systems to hundred to hundred kilowatt systems. Now we're starting to get into larger scale systems, and it's kind of ramping up quickly um, with uh, um, the Blue Lake Rancheria uh, microgrid project. When we um, installed that solar array last year, we thought, okay, that's that's about five hundred. Uh, it's about half a megawatt. Um, which is about almost two acres of solar panels. We thought that was going to be the largest array in the whole county for quite some time, but it's already not because there's a, a larger array going on a rooftop in, in Samoa, uh, on Samoa, at the C.K. Johnson building on um, Samoa Boulevard. So, and then we're, we just submitted a proposal today for, to the California Energy Commission for a two megawatt solar array out the airport, which is um, two and a quarter. Yeah, two and a quarter, right? So that's about nine acres. So, um, so you know, even though we don't have a great resource, uh, we still really value solar energy in the whole county, and as the prices have come down, and, and uh, other factors as well. I mean, primarily the, the formation of the, the CCA and, the, and that local control that we now have to 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 put our own resources towards these types of projects is really accelerating things. So. Um, uh, and you know, statewide, California has over half the solar panels of the entire country, and so what that means for the for the city as a whole, it's it's a real challenge because you have these big swings in power that come onto the grid and, and, and leave the grid with with the sun and the clouds moving away from the panels, and it's just a real dynamic uh, thing that happens that, that the grid operators have to deal with. And so, one of the um, key thing ways to handle that is through using um, energy storage uh, and so um, primarily um, um, we've, we've been focused here locally with using lithium ion battery storage uh, out at Blue Lake we have a half a megawatt lithium, lithium ion battery system from Tesla that has a two hour storage capability so one megawatt hour of storage and so with that battery combined with the solar array out there we're able to um, to sort of buffer that effect of the, when the solar is hitting the grid, and, and we're using that for um, to help uh, increase the economic return on that investment that was made out there by um, consuming power at less expensive times and, and, and generating power uh, and exporting it when the prices are high there. Um, so that's what that's. Uh, uh, being, being deployed at Blue Lake in, in the context of a microgrid, which I'm not sure how, how familiar people are with that term, but a microgrid is essentially, it's a small electricity grid that, that is nested within the larger electricity grid that can detach from the larger electricity grid and then operate independent of it. So it can balance its own modes of generation. 
and then it can reconnect to the larger grid when it, when, <coughs> when it needs to. So that's really important for resiliency, for reliability, for, for critical facilities. The, the Blue Lake Ranch is a nationally recognized Red Cross evacuation center, so it's a shelter so that if we have a big earthquake, that, that facility would be an assembly point. And now we have this reliable power system out there that can island and, and, and operate without an independent grid. For, a, for an extended period of time. If that's, uh, rep we're replicating that microgrid idea at the airport, if we're, um, we just took today submitted a proposal for a large microgrid out of the airport, two megawatts of solar, two megawatt, uh, eight megawatt hour battery. So a very big jump from what we did at Blue Lake, but that's a, obviously a critical facility, the airport, the Coast Guard facility, um, those, we need those in a disaster scenario. So now we have those back. We, if we're fortunate enough to be funded, we'll have those backed up. And then um, throw them up. The, the, um, the grid connected benefits of having that battery out there with that, with that nine acres of storage can't really be underestimated because, or under underemphasized because that much solar out there uh, is gonna have a big impact on the grid out there. So having that storage with it is going to help uh, to buffer the impacts of that large scale solar. So the two kind of more, uh, as, we, as we move in the future here, especially in California, we're going to be seeing more and more solar going in uh, with batteries, uh, less and less solar without batteries. And then, you know, so with, with that, I'd say we're, we expect to see even more uh, larger scale solar arrays going in around the county with RCPA and their programmatic approach to this and then it goes to a whole other level when we start talking about the wind power and that'll transition to the And just to continue back on some of the days, one of the things that we're actually looking at, so you know, as far as that local investment piece, you know, RCPA's you know, shipping in is a pretty significant amount of the, the overall project cost. And you know, one of the things that we also want to make sure, you know, the grant obviously is helping make it, you know, an exciting kind of pilot, but you know, we're also coming up with plan B to say, hey, if we don't get the grant, we still want to move forward with that you know, project and we can still maybe we won't be able to do quite as much of the innovative R and D components, but we can still do the solar and the, and the battery pieces of that with you know, uh, local resources so that we're not dependent on the state to, to subsidize it. But we want to tell them that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do all the, we can do the microgrid stuff. That's the, the, the icing on the cake. Yeah. So. Keep, that, keep that to yourself until after January. <laughs> uh, and so uh, Antoine from Principal Power is going to speak for a few minutes. And because offshore wind technology is relatively new technology, he, he wanted to show a few slides in order to introduce that. So we'll turn it over. Yeah, thank you very much, Alne. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Antoine with uh, Principal Power. Uh, I just want to start by saying that it's a really exciting time for, for California and for renewable energy. Uh, today I'm here to talk to you about you know, offshore wind and how we can sort of bring offshore wind to, to the US and to, to California and hopefully to Humboldt County. Uh, you know, offshore wind is kind of like a, a sleeping giant in the sense that you know, it's sort of, you know, it's a new thing that people are talking about you know, really recently. And there, there has been, you know, a few reasons for that. You know, I think like the main reason is really like the, the recent, you know, technological advancements that we have seen in, 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 the, in the field, and you know, really viable technologies, you know, to be able to deploy the systems, you know, off of the coast of, of California, where the water are really deep. So that's, that's that was the main challenge. So because of those recent advancements, you know, I think that we are seeing, you know, in this in the industry that's going to to be shaped, you know, slowly as we as we go forward. And, and the second reason I think is just, you know, when you look at the, the load, you know, that, that offshore wind, the load profile of offshore wind, I think it adds some value to the grid, especially when we are looking at integrating more renewable energy, you know, in California. And especially when you look at the really aggressive targets that have been set uh, by the state. So, you know, offshore wind um, is sort of, it's at its infancy in, in the U.S. and in California, but we start, you know, understanding that those benefits uh, could be really, really useful and could really help uh, a lot of things uh, in the state of, of California. So, with that, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start with a few words about about the company. So, we are, you know, a small company. We are California-based. So, this is really, 
you know, our backyard. You know, I would say unfortunately we had to open a few offices in Europe because that was where the market was at the time when we wanted to demonstrate our technology. So we had to go you know, to France and Portugal. But we hope that we can, you know, finally bring our technology basically in house <laughs> in California. We are backed by you know global energy leaders uh, all around the world. And we have really worked on uh, a technology called the wind float that is basically a floating foundation uh, on which a turbine, a wind turbine, is directed uh, that we can deploy basically in deep water. So the idea is really to push the boundaries you know, of offshore wind and go to deep areas. And when I say deep areas, I mean you know, 50 meters uh, plus, 50 meters and beyond of, of water depths. Um, and so we have already, in a sense, we already have uh, we have demonstrated our technology and now we have a pipeline of projects sort of all around the world for, for deep waters. But I just want to go back a little bit to, to the basics because I don't know how much you guys know about offshore wind and I have a few minutes. So really the, the industry is, is mature you know, for fixed foundations and those fixed foundations are deployed again in water depths in less than 50 meters. And there is a tremendous growth happening in the industry at this stage. And the trends are to go you know, further offshore and deeper waters and have bigger farms with bigger tailpipes. Um, but at some point, you know, there is a, if you look here, at some point there is really uh, an inflection point where, you know, whether you use monobio jackets or other types of fixed foundations, it just doesn't make any economic sense, you know, to, to continue putting those foundations in the seabed for different reasons. And so you gotta go with floating foundations, and that happens again, you know, at around 50 meters and plus. And a lot of the technologies that have been proposed so far, you know, all belong to the oil and gas industry. So the whole oil and gas industry concepts are using multiple, you know, barges, tension lake platforms, and spars, and they all all have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and as a company, we decided to go for the semi-submersible platform, and we'll tell you a little more details later. Um, but basically, uh, what happens is, if you look at the cost of, of deploying the systems, uh, you know, right now offshore wind is uh, is, is really you know is on the verge of, of converging with you know other types of conventional fossil fuel technology. If you look at those diagrams here, um, and very recently, you know, for fixed foundation, we saw a project that were proposed, you know, at around fifty. You know, dollars per megawatt hour. So that's really much. You know, we're really reaching parity with uh, fossil fuel technologies. You know, like coal, gas, or, or or nuclear. So this is really encouraging, and so the industry is really taking <coughs> off. But the next stage is to go into deeper water, and uh, uh, and that's you know, that's really what we need here in California. Uh, I'll go back to it. Um, what I want to say is that you know, there is already in a sense. The pipeline of projects around the world for floating wind. Um, we had a lot of single units, uh, you know, sort of prototype type of, of projects deployed you know, in Europe uh, and, uh, and in Japan. So that's about six prototypes developed all around the world, so full scale prototypes. Now the industry is moving, you know, to multiple uh, multiple units type of pre commercial projects uh, all around the world, you know. Mostly, you know, in Europe, Asia, and 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 the U.S. actually. So, what I want to say is basically that there is already an industry, you know, happening around, you know, floating wind. So it's not just fixed foundation, but also floating wind with a very large potential all around the world. Um, and so, if I go back to what we do as a as a company, you know, we have deployed we have developed this technology called the wind float, and it's really we are not trying to reinvent the wheel with this technology. We are using conventional turbines, you know, the largest turbines on the market that have a very large, you know, track record, you know, for many many years. We are using you know, expertise from the oil and gas industry with a semi-stable platform, and we are really putting the two together in a very synergistic way. So the, the innovation is really in the marriage of the hydrodynamics and the aerodynamics uh, of the of the system. And so I'm not going to go into detail of the technology, but. The system also is, is more to the seabed, you know, with mooring lines and, and anchors, and, and there is an electrical cable that brings the power back to shore. Um, and with that technology, um, we had to demonstrate the, the viability of that technology, and so we did that with our Windflot 1 project. So that was 
a full-scale 2 megawatt turbine that was deployed off of Portugal from 2011 to 2016. Um, and so with that project, we really demonstrated the viability of the technology. You know, it survived very large storms and large waves. Um, we were able to operate uh, the turbine you know, in, 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 in very high waves too, you know, up to the one year uh, storm uh, return period. And uh, we were able to incorporate some of the lessons learned for, for the next stage, where I'm going to go very quickly again, where we are looking now at basically three commercial projects. So here it's not just one unit of two megawatts, you know, we're looking at three units of eight megawatts for a Portuguese project and uh, four units of six megawatts for a French project. And what's exciting about the, the Portuguese project is, you know, for the first time it's uh, a project that, uh, in which we're using non-recourse financing. So basically we are asking large commercial banks to actually back up the project, which really means that uh, there is credibility in the technology and sort of mainstream recognition that, that the industry is really taking up. So that's, that's really exciting for us. We're about to close on that one. Um, and then we have French project and then we have other, you know, sort of commercial prospects in the bank bank for <coughs> And so let me just go back to California, and I know that you have, a, you have seen the, an overview of the industry. Um, in California, what's, what's happening is that you know, the seabed slopes really steeply down very quickly, and that means that you won't be able to install fixed foundations because you will have too many visual impacts and other issues you know, with the current users on the ocean. So the only way to really start putting some systems out would be on floating foundation. And so you know, we think that our technology is really uh, suited for, for that purpose. Um, but I want to just touch on some of the the, 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 the benefits, I guess, of, of offshore, specifically in California. I think it's, it's important you know, for, for this conversation that we're going to have today. Um, one of the things is really the low generation profile. If you look at the hourly low generation profile uh, of offshore wind, you know, offshore wind is a very great resource because it's really, the wind blows during the day, you know, 24 hours a day with very few lulls and it peaks in the evening typically between 5 and 7 p.m. exactly when we have a peak of consumption of power on the grid. So in a sense it's very complementary um, to, to the consumption and so the, the, the profile is, is, is quite interesting in that sense and as we start putting more, you know, solar energy on the grid and we see a lot more of that sort of duck, duck curve effect um, having more offshore wind will basically avoid the need to ramp up a lot of the power in the evening because you will have that energy coming from the, from the offshore wind farm. And so in, in some way you will, you will able less curtainment on the grid overall in California which is becoming a bigger, a, a bigger and bigger issue. And you will be able to have more penetration of other renewable energy not to be solar. So it's a very complementary asset in the sense of the grid. Um, I'm thinking also uh, Offshore wind being a resource that can compete with you know, onshore wind and especially out of state onshore wind. So they are planning, for example, to build a lot of onshore wind turbines um, you know, in states like Wyoming or Colorado and bring that back to California. Here we are talking about a local resource that is locally generated in California close to load centers. So it's much better for the states to be able to sort of have control on, on, on its own resources. Uh, and, and that would avoid, you know, the, the development of very large transmission updates, you know, to be able to bring this energy from outer states to California. So being large transmission lines, you know, in the desert, for instance. Um, offshore wind in California also represents a huge, you know, economic development opportunity, you know, job creation and, you know, revitalization of, of port areas. Uh, and I'm thinking especially here in Humboldt. Um, if you look at the sort of European model, where you know there is very similar communities in, in Europe um, that you know sort of started from nothing or were sort of in decline, and then offshore wind came and it's it created a whole you know momentum around you know basically driving investment into the community and creating you know port facilities that would allow the deployment of projects. And I'm talking about, for example, Bremerhaven in Germany. And so we see that as something that could be replicated here in California and would create a lot of jobs and drive investment into infrastructure and, and port facilities. Um, and then there is the argument of resiliency, you know, bringing sort of resiliency into the grid when you have a natural disaster, you know, that offshore wind assets will still be operating, basically. 
and so they could be used, you know, for example, for black start or all kinds of you know, backup for backup plans, basically on the grid. Um, so with that, I don't know how much time I have left, but I just wanted to tell a little bit about what's really happening in California. You know, I talked about the very aggressive targets, probably 100 percent of renewables, you know, by 2050. That's already sort of in the making as I'm speaking. Uh, but the whole effort really started in, in January 2016 when there was what you call an unsolicited site uh, lease request, you know, off of Morro Bay, Oops. which is in Central California here. And that started a whole effort, you know, at the state level, and a task force was created with BOEM, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, with the state, you know, creating a task force to start looking at what sites make the most sense for offshoring in California. You know, knowing the extraordinary resource, I would say world-class resource that we have here. And um, what we expected is that there will be an auction, you know, so basically sites will be leased, you know, at some point, and there will be an auction process first in the next year or so. Um, I just wanted to point out that there are a lot of uh, available reports online, you know, that were published by the National Renewable Energy Lab, where they really talk about the potential you know, of offshore in California, they have looked at six different sites and they even have some kind of, you know, economic projections for, for the pro different projects, sizes, so I, I encourage you to, to look at all these, these reports because it's, it's quite interesting actually the, the conclusion that you will find there. Um, I think with that I'll, I'll let it, uh, I think we'll just have discussions. Yeah. Okay. Could you go to slide nine? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's a great segue to what PG&E's role in this. That's really fantastic, by the way. It's very inspiring. Um, so PG&E's role has been to move power from one location, a generation source, to a, uh, another source where the demand is. And what we definitely have seen in the last 10 years and 20 years, but most, more so in the last 10 years, is we're getting a lot of flow in the opposite direction. And we get more and more resources that are coming on the grid, and our grid really wasn't originally designed to take flow and move it in the opposite direction. So, uh, more so, we've, um, we, PG&E has identified the, the uh, growth of distributed energy resources, uh, you know, distributed generation, uh, demand response, energy efficiency, and um, we created an organization that I'm part of called Grid Integration and Innovation. And our role in this in PG&E is to study the edges of these market models of distributed energy resources and figure out how do we make the grid accessible for people to participate, whether you're a consumer or you're a producer or you're a prosumer, um, how do you how do you participate? What are the market mechanisms for the smallest of consumer to the very largest of consumers? And how do we build those systems in place rapidly enough to address things like the duck curve? Because we know now under our current market conditions and our current rate schedules, it drives consumers to behave a certain direction. And so um, uh, there's a lot of effort on the regulatory side, on the utility side, on um, the generation uh, end of, of the, the uh, challenges to develop a way for this market participation. And the, uh, the integrated uh, grid strategy is, is a big piece of that. So um, uh, that's the direction that we would like to move into is using, using things like dynamic rates that will help people know when to consume and when to produce. And, and then we can really start to leverage our, our solar PV resources and our battery resources to start to smoothen out curves like this. You know, I don't, I don't know how many of you are aware, but this summer I believe we went into, um, in the Central Valley area, we went into three periods of time when there were uh, negative prices on the grid which means there was so much production, so much wind, and so much solar that 
um, Kaiso send, and you can get an app on your phone that, that um, looks at Kaiso and the amount of production and the amount of demand. It's really cool. You should look it up. Um, uh, you can look at that, and you can look at the price of electricity, and it's really interesting because the price of electricity went negative, meaning we were, in essence, needing to pay people to consume. Um, and pay people to turn off their generation. So Kaiso was actually sending out messages saying, you know, large wind generators, feather your blades. Um, large solar arrays, if you can turn off or curtail, curtail. And that's not something we really want to do. Um, what we really want to do is find a way to absorb that, to consume it through demand response, uh, you know, pre-cooling buildings, and then um, not using as much cooling in other portions of the, 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 uh, the time period of the day. And so, uh, you know, figuring out how to manage the distribution grid on where those generation sources are coming in, and then figuring out how to move that generation to other locations so that it can be consumed strategically in other places. And, and people can participate in the marketplace. And that's the essence of, a lot of the distribution and transmission forecasting efforts is to figure out what's it going to be like in three years from now? And what's it going to be like in five years from now? And anything beyond five years is such a wild card to try to predict that if you see a study that's 10 to 20 years out in time, you got to really weigh out you know, how many things can change in that amount of time. We had no idea solar prices were going to drop in the way that they did and that the solar penetration was going to be as high as it was. If you had asked the same question 10 years ago, we would have said the ramp rate looks something different than what actually occurred. And the consequence to it is now that we have a dip in the belly of this duck curve that is getting so large that we need to find a way to manage it. And so it's a really fascinating and dynamic time to be trying to figure out how to deploy the right resources, develop microgrids that can, um, can isolate energy and create better reliability and resiliency in certain areas, um, to create battery storage coupled with solar so that we can smoothen out the shape and the intermittency that comes onto the distribution grid, to create demand response mechanisms so that you as a consumer know when to run your air conditioner or when to run your dryer and when not to do those things and actually get compensated in a mechanism for that um, which will help smooth those dynamics out. So as a utility, these are the types of efforts that are going on and there's, it's super exciting. There's a lot of great work going on and I think I'll, I'll wait to talk more about our distribution transmission for our our conversation relative to the local area. So to make that point, the, the wholesale power price here in Arcade between six and seven o'clock today is like sixty-seven bucks and seven cents yeah. per megawatt hour. And, and it was about half that earlier in the day, even less than half that before the sun went down and other power plants had to ramp up to, to meet the, the need as, as it got darker and there was less solar output. So those fluctuations are pretty pretty dramatic over the course of the day as far as what the wholesale price is. Yeah, and, and if you want to try to think about that changes from territory to territory around our state. So in, in it's my brother lives here, I live in the Central Valley, we talk all the time, and he'll be freezing cold, and I'll be cranking my air conditioner because it's 105 outside. And so when it's 105 outside, and everybody's turning on their air conditioner at five o'clock, because that's when they're getting home, that's a huge draw on the system, and yet, there may be cool temperatures over here because the fog is getting drawn in at the same time and the load is a lot less over here. How can we get the, 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 load, the production from here over to where it's needed to be consumed and how do we make that happen? And that's through our transmission lines. Thank you all very much. I have a bunch of questions, but I think what makes sense to do is to start off with a with some audience questions, and uh, panelists may have questions for each other as well, and we'll just intersperse those uh, for uh, for uh, for the time that we have remaining. So uh, maybe take uh, questions in pairs, so two at a time, and then panelists can respond to, to, to those. So I saw one here. Yeah, for the Redwood aggregated you know, purchasing, is it a combined spot market, or do you have fixed PPAs with providers? So it's, it's a mix, and that starts to get into complicated questions. But we don't typically, so that's not the price that we're paying for most of our load. So 
Um, in some cases, we've got PPAs for, for a fixed price, and then you know, some of it's price hedging out. You know, so the bulk of our procurement is done you know, forward looking, but there's, there's sort of like you buy it in like blocks, and then there's like what the actual little load is that's filling in those gaps. And so conversely, if, you, if you're under on like what you've got, a, let's say you bought a 100 megawatt you know, sprint, and you're not using all of that, then you actually can make money in the market if your price is lower than what the market price is, and, or if you're having to fill in a gap, then it's higher. And so um, it's, you know, it's uh, fairly complicated as far as the you know, an hourly and 15 minute you know, process. Um, but yeah, we're not, it's like, we're just riding the market and saying, oh gosh, prices went up. So we've got you know, forward prices locked in. Um, but again, there's, there's still economic advantages if we can reduce load, but it's you know, 10 times more expensive than normal, then you know, we can, we can you know, be oversubscribed, and then that you know, profits us in the, in the overall market. So. What do call it? about how much on average is our other TPAs? Uh, so it depends on the resource. Um, you know, so like just wholesale sort of system power is uh, you know in the forty dollars a megawatt hour range, and then if you like go up to large hydro, you know, Pacific Northwest, just you know not like eligible renewable, that gets into the you know maybe forty five. It's not very much more expensive, forty five dollars. You go to like uh, wind, you can go up a little bit more, you know, maybe high forties. Um, you know, if it's from out of state, if it's in state wind or in state solar from you know from Southern California, that's more like the fifty buck range, the fifty five. Um, you know, uh, local biomass or local small hydro is in like the eighty dollar range, and then the, the the local solar prices that I was looking to again, that's just kind of some indicative price we've got from some you know. Um, Project developers and what we're kind of looking at for the airport project, is closer to like hundred dollars a megawatt hour. So, you know, like I said, the, the local solar is about twice as expensive as like the mega projects in the desert. But conversely, you know, we can't get to one hundred percent just trying to import mega project, you know, solar from the desert. And so that's where, you know, and then, you know, we'll, we'll see where the wind comes in. It's probably going to be in, the, in that hundred dollar megawatt hour range to begin. You know, that's what we're hoping for. So, could I could I add just a little bit is. Um, there's a there's a real need to be able to generate within your local region to ensure that the, the what power you're purchasing is actually reaching to the area that you're you're serving. And we could buy power from a long distance away, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that energy is going to arrive at the point of where it's being consumed. And so there's a there's a resource adequacy and, and local resource adequacy that needs to be um, purchased within a certain area so that the power is actually served to that area. And there's price like congestion. There's a congestion price that gets added. So if there's a grid constraint, which sometimes can be just oh something happens in some particular hour, and that could actually jack up the price because they're saying hey there's there's a constraint on the grid, and that gets reflected in kind of the overall wholesale price and so it's you know. Basically, yeah, it's not just like, oh yeah, just put it on the desert and somehow magically it gets everywhere it needs yeah, to go. And, the electron so. doesn't know who bought it. <laughs> it's just going to the nearest source that eats it up. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so, we know that since battery storage sounds very important in the distribution and smoothing of the curve, so can I assume that most of the renewable like, energy project from now on will also have the battery storage included in those kind of projects? Or is it like also like another kind of uh, auction you have to like ready for that? I'd, I'd say both. I'd say the, the goal would be try to try to marry it together because there's mutual benefits. Um, as, as Dave mentioned, with solar and batteries, uh, there's strategies that you can use to, to manage whether you're absorbing that power or, or, uh, or exporting it. Um, and then there's also advantages in a marketplace for um, battery only and absorbing um, power and then, and then uh, uh, reducing your demand or what the, how the grid sees your demand, even though you may not be curtailing your demand because you're using that battery as a source. Uh, so there's strategies in both directions. I just wondered if, uh, just to, to tie onto that, if you might say a little bit about um, so the, the cost of, if you, want to, if you want to install a large solar generator, let's say, and you connect it to a system, and let's say there's already quite a bit of solar, and the system's kind of maxed out in terms of what it can handle, 
but some, but I, but I want to put solar in too. And you know, talking about the, the, the cost of infrastructure and the fact that that goes to the person wanting to put it in. Yeah, I think that's really important to notice. Um, thank you. Is that you know each each piece of the grid that's out there has its own capacity, and it has a capacity limit. And we also have a hosting capacity limit. How much distributed generation can that um, device host and and take on? And if you want to look into a really um, a neat resources is go to Google, type in and search for PG&E RAM, RAM, and um, uh, resource uh, uh, resource uh, auction mechanism, and you can zoom right into your area and you can see the distribution lines and the transmission lines. Click on the distribution line and it'll give you how much hosting capacity that circuit has and how much solar can it take, how much battery can it take. Um, before there's a major upgrade or some kind of overload that's seen on various pieces of the grid. And you can think of the, the pieces of the grid close to you, you can think of them at the substation, and you can think of them as further upstream. And each time you add on a new generation source, if you reach a certain limit on those devices, then somebody's got to pay to have those devices improved or hardened to be able to handle your system. So if we all put solar on, and I'm the last guy to go put solar on, and I go to submit for my project, and I've overloaded the system, some of those costs, if not all of those costs, are going to roll over onto me. Um, some of those costs are going to roll onto the entire rate base of, of uh, the PG&E territory, which is kind of the advantage of having a, a larger base of people paying into the the system is that those costs get distributed across everybody instead of lumped onto a single individual. Um, but in essence, if I want to put on a certain system and I overload the system, if I want to put on a large array and I overload certain assets, I'm going to have to pay to have those assets improved in order to connect. Oh, lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> This is a follow-on just to that, and actually it's for principal power. Uh, thinking of hosting capacity, um, you know, to build an offshore wind farm, the first megawatt of wind you build costs you hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Uh, and then each additional megawatt costs a lot less, and so it makes a lot of sense to build as many megawatts as you can once you're out there. Um, but our hosting capacity here, in terms of our transmission to the rest of the grid, is tiny, right? It's maybe 100 megawatts. Maybe you can, right? 120? I think right? it's less. Seven. Yeah, yeah. Seven, <laughs> seven, 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 right. Yeah. So, how are you going to manage that situation? <laughs> that, that's a very good question. So, uh, indeed, you've got some constraints here locally with the way the grid is set up, I guess. And you've got really just, I think, two, two transmission lines going to the California backbone, right? I think they're each about 115 uh, kilovolts. Yeah. And so you can really move about 70 megawatts of power uh, through that line, through those two lines. Um, but what we are looking at really here is to sort of start an industry, I guess. That's the idea. So if we can do a project here locally in Humboldt, which would be a small project, right? At some point, if we can bring a whole industry somehow around here, you know, there will be hopefully you know grades that will be made to those transmission lines and then we'll be able to inject for the entire state of California. Would That's sort of like a big vision we're thinking. Right? Would you be paying for those upgrades? Oh well that's something that, that we work? have to discuss. You know, I don't think it's gonna be just on, on us PPI on physical power. I think it's, it has to be a, a, a much broader, you know, sort of effort, you know, taken at the, at the state level. And that's what we are hoping for. But you know, right now we're just sort of exploring, you know, the possibilities here in Humboldt County because it's it's a world class resource, and you have some kind of natural benefits, you know, here with the community, with the port, uh, with the university, with a lot of local knowledge, you know, in terms of environmental impacts and, and, and all the other stuff that that you need to know for you know for deployment of those projects. So we are really you know really excited, I guess, about about doing something here, but we are still at a very exploratory sort of stage, if you want. And it's going to keep in mind that you know, there's the 70 that could be exported, and then there's <coughs> 100 to 160 that we're using locally all the time. And so you know, the, the upper bound is you know, our local demand plus what could be exported. 
you know, and, and to that point, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, a lot of that local need is being met by the PG&E power plant, as you know, um, which is very flexible, and so that's really, you know, a, an area where the, you know, that plant can ramp up and down, and so if we had an intermittent resource, then we'd, be, we'd have to work with PG&E to, you know, integrate it. It's, you know, easier said than done, but really that facility was designed to say, okay, this could meet our local needs because we can't import that, and so PG&E can ramp up that natural gas power plant to, to accommodate our load. But um, it also could say, oh, there's wind coming in to meet the load. All right, wind's blowing great. Let's say we have, you know, 120 megawatt project that's like, okay, that's meeting all our demand, you know, maybe even a little bit of export. Oh, the wind's dying back. That plant can fill in those gaps and, and be responsive to, to basically level it out. And so, you know, that really is a, a good asset, you know, within that constraint. But um, to, to that point, you know, a first phase would really be looking at what's kind of meeting local needs with maybe some, you know, some export potential. Um, before you can really you know, move a much bigger scaling up to, to improve the infrastructure to, to do a you know, 500 or 1 gigawatt project. So, yeah. I think it's it's worth mentioning too that um, uh, the, the power plant that's here, uh, the, the natural gas power plant, is used for voltage, uh, voltage support. And so when we bring power over from the Central Valley over the 115 kV line, the voltage becomes really unstable, it drops, it gets out of control, and without that power plant, it we actually wouldn't be able to serve power to this area. You wouldn't be able to import any electricity to the area. So that power plant um, manages that voltage and then pushes it out onto the 60 kV lines that serve this coastal area. So what it's, it's interesting, you know, can a wind service uh, provide that same kind of voltage support and can the combination of the two when there's no wind can we ramp up the the natural gas facility and and when there is wind or maybe there's a balance of both because there's not quite enough wind um, we can use that natural gas plant to shave peaks off from the demand uh, or supply and things like that so there's creative ways that we can repurpose using different um, tools in our toolkit and that's one of the tools Uh, yeah, so you guys have talked a lot about the technical potential. Oh, is it me? No, go ahead. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, so clearly there's a lot of technical potential and capacity here in Humboldt County, but there's also a policy mechanism that can help and hinder deployment. Um, so I guess just as an example, um, as you guys probably know, there's like this tariff battle about solar modules uh, with the International Trade Commission going on. So can you speak to how that might affect, just as an example, like this two megawatt project we're trying to build, in Humboldt County, and all of a sudden we have a new tariff on right. international solar modules. Does that kind of totally derail that project? That's a great question. Yeah, um, and and um, so we, we we have a risk there that we've identified, and, and uh, we we have taken um, measures to try to mitigate that risk to the best of our ability. Um, and so and, and uh, actually, the keepers here. From also speak to this. Uh, he's very familiar with the, with the ITC ruling, and it, it affects the module prices. So, um, and you know, we could see pretty big swings, a pretty big increase in module pricing because um, some of the American companies um, felt like they were being unfairly treated by Chinese modules that were coming into the to the country and, and driving the prices down. We, our our the American manufacturers have been going out of business and there's two left and they were trying to, to defend their businesses and so there's uncertainty right now as to whether or not that's going to result in some 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 extra tariff on imported modules so one of the reasons why we've been uh, able to accelerate solar so much is because module prices are so low because they're coming in from China and they produce them at very very cheap prices and sell them to us very very cheap so um, but I think that, um, and I'll let Matthew speak for this, but I think that um, what the, the, uh, the risk there is manageable and that um, the, 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 the expected range in pricing is not going to result in a deal killer for, for the project. It's going to result in a less, it, it's going to be a higher dollar per megawatt hour price than um, RCA will have to pay for the solar, but it's still within the range of what 
uh, is is tolerable to. Yeah, and you know, I can let the cat out of the bag. I guess yes, sir. The, the project's <laughs> contingent on you know getting the grant. Although, like I said, we want to really move it forward. If we can't, you know, that said, it's still preliminary at this point. But we did an RFP for solar. That guy over there is the one that, that got it with the, the local company. Um, for that two and a quarter megawatts of, of solar. But in that process, we, we asked all the respondents to provide a worst case scenario with the tariff being as high as they could really envision it, you know, invest, you know until they have, you know, and, and then a more like what the prices are today scenario. And again, as, as, as Dave mentioned, it's not a deal breaker. It's, it makes it more expensive, but it wasn't like, oh, if we go with that high end one, this thing's dead in the water. So, you know, I think we're, we're moving forward either way. certain protection devices uh, that are on our within our system and these devices are programmed to only accept a certain amount of load and if the load on the lines should exceed that they'll open up and the system will shut off okay so uh, in case let's say some the six seven distributor who wanted to come and give to how do you decide that okay fine we will not going to uh, you know accept the generation from this source uh, how do you just uh, levelize that cost to everybody, or maybe right, who, right. who is coming last, or like that. You know, there's probably some nuanced detail there. Um, I've been involved with a few uh, concurrent load applications, mm -hmm. um, new load applications, and also new generation applications, and it literally is a first come, first serve. And if your project enters the interconnection review process, mm -hmm. and you there are several different stages of complexity, and if it's simple, there's not a lot of projects or not a lot of um, issues on the grid, then it's a fast track and it moves right through. And like when I put solar on my house, I think it was three days and it was improved because there was no issues that I caused, so it was it was super easy, it went right through. But if you have a project that requires additional engineering, then it can take longer. So if we were all to submit our project at the same time, it literally would go off from date of receipt and the start of that processing. And the first person to make it through that process and get submitted is the one that gets counted in the system first. Um, and what if, let's say, I have promised that I will be uh, giving this much of generation and let's say something happens and my system shut off. And all of a sudden, if that generation not comes in, what, what, I mean, what solution is that? And how do you get compensated? Maybe compensated, yeah. what should be like? That is one of the issues we have to figure out, oh. especially <laughs> with the duck curve, oh, yes. is, is as we call upon people to curtail their arrays, mm -hmm. you know, that's really not what anyone wants to do. And um, so that is one of the current standing issues that we have to work out in this new era of, of lots of generation. All right, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I don't think I had a really great answer for you, but <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of these question marks out there right now. <laughs> question up in the middle. With the solar energy that is being imported, for example, in, in Riverside, what is the percentage of energy loss happening throughout the transition? It's, it's, I mean, so, you know, the, the way that the, the Kaiso market works, it, it's, it's a pretty big pool, and so, you know, the grid's managed as a whole, like, you know, resource, so it's not like, you know, as you would say, like, you know, if you're buying power from, you know, a wind project down here, you're not necessarily having to say, oh, there's some special wet route that that electron's getting at. You're basically paying people to, to feed into the overall, um, you know, grid, and so you know, it's like it's like a big swimming pool, basically. And it's like, okay, we've got our Humboldt County straw that's pulling out water from here, and they're like, okay, well, we're paying those guys down there to put power in. We're paying these guys to put power in, and now the the pricing will reflect 
like I said, the congestion and some of those other factors. So it's not like it, it doesn't get covered, but it's, I mean, overall grid losses is like 5% or something like that, maybe less than 5 so it's not, I mean, and again, it would be different if there was just that one, you know, facility and we were just the only load and you were trying to get it all the way here, but, you know, it's like some of our power is going to somebody else and, you know, and so it's, it's more of a shared resource. And again, that, if we had somebody from Kaiso, they're the ones that are actually managing that whole system at, at the state level and saying, hey, you guys need to ramp up, you know, you guys need to ramp down to make sure that there's actually power getting to every corner of the grid that it needs to get to. And there's, you know, assets like the pg e power plant that are critical to make sure that the lights actually stay on regardless of what we're buying. And conversely, you know, um, you know, making sure that there's price mechanisms and that the power we're going, you know, that we're paying to put into the grid gets credited to us and, and vice versa. So it's, it's a, it's a pretty interesting dynamic system, but um, you know the the losses. I mean, it's certainly a, a factor, but it's not big enough that it kind of, the way that the system's managed. You know, it's, it's it's a component of the price, but it's not like a deal. You know, a big piece of it. Okay. Well, this is a question for you, Matthew, that I've been wondering for a while. Um, you talk you talk about your 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 bathtub metaphor here. We also heard about the Energy Peninsula and the sort of resource resource adequacy concerns with Humboldt County. So, to, to what extent and what is the mechanism through which RCEA is responsible for managing the resource adequacy for Humboldt County? If you're just buying from straws elsewhere, and are you obligating PG&E to generate in Humboldt County in order to backfill for the local resource adequacy? And I just am curious as to what that mechanism looks like. Yeah, so the, the resource adequacy is all, it's a whole like different like process than like buying energy. And, and again, when you're when you're buying energy, there's like the, the load where you're paying so you know, the price I pull up on my phone is the, like the local price. And if you were generating power here in Arcata, that's what you'd be being, you know, if you're getting a wholesale price for it, that's what you'd be getting. And that's not necessarily the same as the, the statewide price. And so um, there's basically you, Everything goes through the California Independent System Operator, so I couldn't, I can't buy you know, directly sort of from some power plant. What I do is I pay that power plant to put it into the grid, and then I buy power from the California Independent System Operator. And the, the, the market mechanism for that is somewhat independent from the whether pg e has to ramp up or not. So Kaiso might say, hey, pg e ramp up. Now, it's, it's kind of easy to sort of look at that for Humboldt County because we got this sort of like fishbowl effect of just there's this one line, so it's, you can kind of conceptualize it, but if, let's say we were Sacramento, I was like, well, stuff's coming from all over the place, and they're not saying, well, what's coming in here, what's coming in there, and so, you know, we're kind of a unique and, you know, situation being sort of easily identified of what's coming in and out, but the, the way that the market works, it's more of a price-based approach, and so, for example, you know, the pg e power plant has you know resource adequacy you know value that pg is getting paid for providing that resource adequacy or, or you know and, and if they're generating when there's high congestion they're getting you know that congestion you know as a, as a benefit and so the, the the way the market works um, you know basically there's 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 market mechanisms that incentivize pg to ramp up when they need to and incentivize people to ramp down when they don't and then we have to pay our share of the overall resource adequacy but like we don't pay for like Arcata resource adequacy. We have to pay for like Northern California resource adequacy. So again, a lot of this, you know, sometimes it's easy to kind of just look at our little Humboldt County bubble, but the way that the Kaiso manages the grid is a, a bigger scale than just like county by county. And so, but again, it does get granular down to like the congestion pricing is like this particular line because of something that happened over here in the, you know, the Central Valley gets congested and there might be one hour where it's this crazy high price. You know, we've seen like weird little local spikes in prices um, for local prices because of those congestion situations. So. So it sounds like there might be a little bit of a cross subsidization going on where SMUD or someone that isn't an insular in their grid is paying into the resource adequacy in the same way that we are, even though it's maybe more of a constraint here than it might be somewhere else that's more interconnected. Yeah, and, 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 and some of those price mechanisms kind of, you know, they, they, they're more on like the generator side of, hey, if you're generating power in an area that's constrained, you're getting compensated for that, and then there's there's pricing that, that, that balances that out. But overall, yeah, I mean, so, you know, the, the system isn't set up where like, oh, this community way up in the mountains of the Sierra Nevadas is just getting hosed on prices, right. and, you know, so there's a little bit of sort of socialization of saying, hey, the grid is a resource for everybody, and we're trying to maintain reliability for everybody, 
And so the cost gets divvied up to every load serving entity. So they say, here's what you, you know, need to buy in resource adequacy. And you know, there's, there's different categories, but it, they don't you know, assign that based off of exactly you know, how many customers are on one particular leg of the grid that might be more congested. So, I mean, to the extent that you, you, you kind of pointed out, there's like Humboldt County benefits from being part of the grid that PGE operates because, you know, you live in West Haven and you're at the end of some line that gets knocked down by trees all the time. It's probably more expensive to maintain that leg of the grid than you know, somebody that lives in an apartment in Oakland that, you know, how much it's costing for the grid. So, you know, I think. We benefit from the you know being part of a, a larger you know um, grid infrastructure, and, and it's what allows renewables. That, you know, it's like if everybody was there. I mean, like the microgrid kind of is an interesting sort of flip of that of having little opportunities for local like mini grids, but that are still you know part of the larger system that's making you know a cost effective for everybody to have electricity service. But you you have required some requirements to, to put in generation and storage, right? Yeah. So the, the storage. You know, so so we, we have requirements around just having long-term generation. That doesn't have to be local. Uh, and we also have storage requirements. And to, to the earlier question about you know storage, I mean, it's not quite cost-effective. You know, people aren't just going around everywhere and saying, oh, I can make, I can get rich putting in Tesla batteries. Otherwise, there'd be a lot of people doing it. So there's a mandate that says any load-serving entity has to put in a certain amount of storage. And so you know, and that's where. The microgrid project's really interesting because, okay, we got to do storage somewhere to just be meeting, you know, it's very broad. It's just saying, the state needs storage, thou shalt do X percent of your load, you know, one percent of your peak load has to be installed or contracted, you know, for storage. The neat part about this project is, well, gosh, if we do that and we do it locally and we do it with solar and we do it at the airport and the Coast Guard, then we can leverage that instead of just meeting our storage mandate at the state level to something that if the power goes out, we can actually operate the airport and the Coast Guard, you know, on that microgrid, and so it's a really kind of exciting way to not just sort of do the bare minimum, but to have it have additional benefits, which still doesn't pay for itself, but, you know, it's hard to quantify, like, how much is the Coast Guard being able to run missions in a natural disaster worth, you know, I would say a lot, I don't know what the dollar amount is, but, you know, it's something that I think, you know, we as a community, you know, are, are trying to put our money where our mouth is and say, you know, hey, let's, let's invest in, in doing that so that we have that resource. I think it, it's also cool that this, this microgrid project is pretty neat with the use of battery and the distribution components serving a number of different customers, the Coast Guard and the airport and a couple of other customers out there. It presents an example for us to develop the partnerships, the contracts, the rates, the, um, the technologies, the visibility at our control center to be able to scale these types of microgrids into larger and other com communities. And, and we can think of your average um, maximum capacity on a feeder, a target, is 6,000 customers. And those are, you know, the, the wire that's coming out of a substation and, and the number of customers that can be served off of that wire is aimed to be 6,000 customers or less. And we like to see it at about 4,000 customers. Well, imagine if you were to take a whole feeder and turn it into a series of small microgrids. It's a pretty fascinating idea. You have to create all that local generation, you create all that local control over those, and that uh, reliability and resiliency, and, and it's, a, it's a pretty neat paradigm shift we're, we're going to see in our grid and grid operations. Question here. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you all for your work. It's very inspiring. Feel a little bit better about the future. <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, maybe the panel can look like farther into the future, like 30 or 40 years from now. Um, I, and I know you don't have a crystal ball, and I know so much has changed, uh, and it keeps changing so rapidly. What is a uh, what, what is a 2050 carbon-free uh, future look like? What what, the, what does that entail? <laughs> well, so broadly, I, I'll, I'll, it's far enough out to be I'll tell you exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, mean, what is I, I think, you know, one of the, a couple of the key pieces are, um, you know, it's going to be diverse. Like, I don't think there's a silver bullet of like, oh, we're just going to do tons of solar and tons of battery and problem solve. You know, I, I mean, maybe that'll happen, but I, I think it's more likely that there's going to be a blend of resources. You know, that, the first slide that I already put up, it, I, you know, it warms my heart when I see, like, here's the load and here's offshore wind. And like, oh, look, it's kind of matches. And so, you know, I think that's a, you know, locally, that's a resource we have. Obviously, if you're in, you know, you know Minnesota, you don't have, or maybe 
Minnesota Great Lakes, but <laughs> you're in Oklahoma, you don't have offshore wind, you know, but um, it's a resource, you know, for us, that's a big resource. Um, you know, solar, I think, can, can go everywhere, and I think the integrating the battery piece of it. So, you know, I think one, it's going to be, you know, a blend and a, and a mix of different scales, you know, small scale distributed systems, larger system, you know, big, big opportunities. And I think, you know, the other thing that's going to be different now, if I had to, you know, try to gaze at a crystal ball, is, you know, the, the list of players, you know, you know investor owned utility, the, you know, the, the grid manager, the loan serving entity, Kaiso. I think the other player that you alluded to is going to be the customer. And instead of just being a consumer, it's really being more of like, oh, you're actually participating and saying, oh, prices are crazy high right now. I'm going to respond to that and help reduce overall costs by shifting my load. And I'm going to have, you know, the ability to, you know, power my home with solar, maybe I've got a home battery system, maybe I've got a car that's able to you know, charge when prices are negative, and so it's free to actually use electricity when you're, you know, there's too much sun, oh, let's charge all the cars then, not when it's expensive, or even, you know, having them be able to discharge back into the grid if there's really a constraint. And so I, I think, you know, that, that bringing it down to that, that sort of distributed uh, element is an exciting potential to really not just have big centralized systems, although I think we're always going to have some of those, um, you know, and, and really integrating the two scales, and I think there's there's both challenges of if you've got lots of big projects, how do we integrate that? You know, and that's what you know you guys start talking about. And then for those small systems, how do we integrate that too? And how do we make this all work on a you know a system that wasn't originally designed to to you know use their oh put in a big coal power plant and push out electrons to everybody? And it's much different. I want to want to play off from that in, in that I think it's all about data and programming and automated functionalities so that when we when when these prices and generation sources fluctuate it happens automatically i'm a big um, uh, uh, advocate of automated technologies in the sense that when my daughters leave out of their room i want their light to go off automatically because they don't do it on their own half the time so i want it to go off and the same thing happens when I plug in my electric car. Currently, I have to manage when it charges. I mean, I can program the car to charge at a certain time of the day, but that future is coming when the car communicates with the grid and says, ooh, there's surplus electricity, I don't need to charge. Ooh, I better store up now and have discharge later. And so that, that is the true smart grid. If we want to talk about the smart grid and the integrated grid platform is, how do all of our grid of things communicate and do it in a database way that is this neural web to be able to um, situate itself correctly to manage the grid loaded? And that's all these smart devices. And I think another piece of it is we're, if we're thinking out 30, 40 years into the future, a lot of times we think about, OK, what kinds of generation sources do we want? We want it to be renewable, maybe. And what does that look like? Uh, and and I, the, I absolutely agree that the automation and control is really important. But the other part of it that seems more mundane, but which is incredibly important, which is that we need to invest an incredible amount in the wires and then the infrastructure to move the power around if we want all of this to work. And so if, if that future is to be a largely renewable future, we really need to make sure that we're making those investments so that all of that uh, that backbone of the system is solid and can uh, and, and, and so the, the uh, congestion constraint isn't the constraint that is stopping us from doing what we need to do. And so uh, uh, I'll predict that we'll do it because we need to do it. And, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that's going to be a key to the to, to making all of that happen. And we once thought that the grid would um, not be necessary have all these distributed resources and, and we would all power our, our things independently. I, I'm convinced now that I'm thick into this um, that that's not the case, that we will be moving power from one location to another um, based off from the ability to generate and the need to where it is. We have time for just a, maybe one or two more questions. Yes. Are we really talking about a carbon free future? Is this uh, carbon free is a shell game? Because your board is really dedicated to biomass in a big way. You know, that's a that's a good question as far as you know, looking at you know, talking 30 years out. I think you know, right now there's a component, you know, because if you look at resources that we have in Humboldt County, there's you know, 
lots of wood waste, and that's you know something that currently is being converted into you know electricity in some cases. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, Kevin's working on a project to kind of you know that's funded by the state to you know sort of evaluate that. And you know, if I'm thinking 30 years out, you know, I think we're still probably going to be making hopefully we'll still be making things out of wood, and so there'll still be you know woody material. Whether that would be being used for electricity or like bioplastics, it's hard to say. Probably if it's being used for electricity, it's going to be you know newer technologies like gasification or you know something that's you know the, the next iteration of that. You know, although you know again, it's kind of you know it's hard to say which of those pathways would would be kind of the, the long term potential because I know I'm not an expert on like the bioplastics and stuff like that. But that's something I've heard that's you know a potential that you know might be a, a more economic value than you know using a gas fire to, to make electricity. But you know, on the flip side, it's base load electricity that's, you know, you can actually kind of control it. And then like the wind and the sun, it's something that, you know, is a resource that's uh, got consistency and you know, it's got to be done right to make it, you know, not adding excessive amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. You know, that's an issue I think that's come up in, you know, the East Coast where there's, uh, you know, European subsidies that are actually incentivizing people to like make pellets and send them to Europe. You know, here it's more of a waste issue of like, we've got a big pile of sawdust, what are we doing with that? And so, um, you know, uh, that one's that one's a trickier one. I, you know, it's not. That's probably you know. The, I think if I was gonna bet on wind versus that, I'd, I'd bet on wind probably. <laughs> so. well, well, one thing to consider with that is that um, is, so even wind is an inverter-based power source. So our grid, one of the reasons why it's so stable is that we have these big rotating machines that spin at the same rate. That generates 60 hertz. That creates a nice stable. Grid, and as we go towards more renewable energy, we, we go to inverters now. Everything's solid state, transistors, so you don't have that inertia in the system, so it, it becomes harder to manage. Even wind is, is an inverter based power system, so I think having something like biomass um, that, can, that can provide that inertia in the system, there's a, there's a, there's a role there is for, for grid stability that I, 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 I see. You know, provided it's done in a in a, uh, in a in such a way that you're you're using waste or you're well within the margins of, of using using much less than, than is being extracted. As long as you can be um, on that side of the of the line, um, there is a a technical place for that inertia within the stable grid. I think there are also the environmental costs as there are environmental costs to all of these technologies. They're, they're just different environmental costs. Biomass has a very high public health in the it, it, it does in the way that we're generating it right now. And so if we're looking 30 years into the future, that's part of what we need to be looking at is what are the pathways towards uh, ways of uh, generating power from various resources that are considerably cleaner than, than, than they are now. So. The, the, the way we're doing it now is is, uh, is a fairly crude uh, uh, technology, but there are technology pathways that, that can be cleaner around biomass. They're not currently economic, and, and so we need to, uh, if we're going to use those resources, figure out what's that pathway to, to get to a much cleaner version of that that, that is economic. Uh, but uh, uh, So that's not a, something we're going to get done tomorrow, but over that 30-year time scale, um, that, that may be a possibility. Um, one last question. I have a question about the duct curve, and one way to address that would be to start using more electricity when there's a lot of solar on the grid. And we could do that by fuel switching buildings, getting off natural gas, but heating. I mean, it's a big, big thing in our area. We, we are heating the climate. So if we we're using, instead of natural gas boilers, we could get to an air source or other type of pump system, uh, we would be switching from natural gas use to an electricity use, thereby taking the bottom of that, that over, over generation risk and, and using some of that electricity. Um, what, how is, I mean, because we've only been talking about the electric grid here, um, how, how is the natural gas grid um, part of this conversation here? I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, so I think we need the market mechanisms there. Um, the technologies are there. 
we can apply these technologies in different purposes at different times, but we as consumers, building operators, facilities managers, need to have the market signals that say, okay, that technology use at that time of day makes sense for me to do. I, that pencils, I'm going to do that. Um, we have a couple of supply side pilots right now where um, when there's a dip in the curve, um, we pay you to turn on devices. And the, in particular, we're testing this out in agricultural regions where we can ask pump operators that are running, um, you know, uh, uh, 100 and 300 and 500 horsepower uh, pumps, well pumps, uh, you know, please turn on your system. And that takes, soaks some of that energy up. Um, so those are, that is a totally valid consideration. Um, classically, under our current regulations, we're not allowed as pg e to do fuel switching, to recommend fuel switching. Um, and that paradigm may change where we're allowed to actually now start to incentivize entities to switch from one fuel to a different fuel type. Yeah, and and the, the, the big piece is the natural gas piece of it, if you're you know, talking about greenhouse gas emissions and you know, a, a future where we're not dependent on fossil fuels, transportation is like the elephant in the room. I mean, Humboldt County, more than half of our emissions are from transportation, and then you've got electricity and, and um, you know, natural gas is like the, the little brothers to that. And so, you know, and that's again, you know, a, a tremendous opportunity because there's already electrical infrastructure, you know, you, you've got to ramp it up and, you know, cars are parked. 95 percent of the time, or whatever it is, you know, and so oh, we'll charge them when the you know the the need is there, and you know, and so I think, you know, that's what I'm mean, obviously the, the best greenhouse gas solution is to not drive your car at all, take a bus or ride a bike. But if you're going to have a car, if you're going to use a car, you know, when you need to use a car, having that be you know powered by uh, you know either electricity or other you know hydrogen, which is kind of a deferred renewable electricity you know source potentially, um, you know, that lets you have a, a fair amount of flexibility when you're charging that car because it's, you know, sort of a slower process or, or you know, a, a more flexible process. It's not like, oh, I can't see, you know, just because cars are sitting there most of the time. I mean, everybody's car in this room is sitting there right now. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, you know, probably a, a big challenge, but also probably the biggest opportunity because it's like we can keep whittling away at more and more renewables, but if we don't start dealing with transportation, it's not going to, you know, that's the, the big thing we need to take a bite out of. So. What's the region this dub curve is? Is it California? Is it the U.S.? California. California. So what does the local curve look like? It's not quite like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think last, last question. It's just a clarification. Of, um, as a consumer, and I love being incentivized by PG&E, I have a smart rate plan where I feel like not to, the time of day to like not use my dryer my electric dryer because it was going to cost more and, and there's shots again and that was but just to clarify our CEA which now we're part of Community Choice Energy doesn't have a smart rate plan or is yeah, that right? So, so there's there's a couple different things so everybody actually so, so there was a, a PG&E you know, smart rate that was uh, specifically that you know which a percentage of Humboldt County customers are on and at the moment and this is not to throw them under the bus or anything at all, but we don't have the data available to like do that just because of the way that we work with them on metering, which is something that is looking to change. But actually everybody, you know, so that's going to be the norm pretty soon. I forget what the date would roll out for time of use pricing for all customers is. Uh, I, I believe the current date is 2019, residential time of use rollout. Yeah, and I think, you know, so in about a year, it's going to be just it's a, it's a statewide rule, and so, uh, you know, which, you know, we're, we're still talking about maybe doing some, you know, a little more innovative things in that and saying, like, okay, how can we kind of have a customized local program, and we didn't launch that in the first, whatever it's been, six months, but, because um, uh, I think, you know, both on the commercial and the residential side, it's one of those things where, you know, if you don't know, I mean, like, I'm on a time of use rate, because I've got a bunch of cars, so that's auto, you know, encourages you to charge at night, like, when prices are low, and actually, you know, early morning's fine, but if you, come home and just want to plug right in, you're like, oh, you're going to pay a price because that's when prices are high. And so um, that's, you, there are time of use rates that you can be on if, you, if you're interested in that. Um, and then that's actually going to be the, the norm in about a year or so. Um, so we can probably go on all night, but I think we need to wrap up. Um, 
And uh, I guess before we do that, uh, this uh, approach of, of having a focus on uh, clean energy in, in Humboldt County in this series is something that we're looking to do, I think, going forward, uh, at least one uh, talk like this every semester. And so uh, this is, a, a, I think, now a feature of, uh, of uh, something we want to do. I want to give a, a big thank you to our panelists. You did a great job. And I also want to give a big thank you to the audience, which had a fantastic set of interesting questions. I have a bunch of questions here, but I didn't have to answer, ask them because you all ask all my questions. So.